Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We are one of the most privileged groups of people in our country, all of you. You represent one or two percent of this country. So for you, I know it doesn't appear that way, but opportunity is almost ready-made. You don't have to fear for the future, and you have that privilege and that ability to only do what you love doing. I can't begin to tell you how fantastic that is for anyone to be able to say that. You know, when I grew up, I had to be a lawyer, a chartered accountant, or a doctor, and I was not very brainy, and my marks were terrible, and so they, I had no option, but I was shipped off to the UK to do chartered accountancy because they, they weren't able to recognize that my marks were not good. So they didn't know that at that point in time. And I studied there, and I happily, uh, I shouldn't admit to this, but of course I failed my chartered accountancy exam the first time and then finally got through. But here I am. And I'm here to talk to you about the birth of an industry. It's an industry which is famous and infamous in many ways. It created new towns, new cities. Gurgaon, for all its warts and all its problems, is one such city. It's created new pockets of opportunity for millions of youth in our country. And it's also made India far more well-known in the global world. I remember the days when we were shipping people out to the US to get trained at our client premises. Many of them didn't have passports. Many of them had never traveled overseas. Most of them hadn't even been on a plane more than a couple of times. And suddenly, we would ship them out to Kentucky or some Texas or somewhere else in the middle of winter, in the middle of snow. And it was a journey of discovery for them to get trained in new things, to see a whole new world. And that, when they bring those experiences back, it changes the way they live, what they do, how they relate to each other, and how they think about the future. But back to the story of the birth of an industry. I must tell you, the birth of this industry is a story of naivety, foolishness, and sheer hope. And if I leave you with no other message than it is to have hope, take risks, and drive change. So I am a veteran of GE in the Jack Welch era. That was a, one of the great companies in the world. I had come back to India after 20 years, 25 years of wandering around Europe and the US to run GE Capital. And the idea, like so many good ideas, was not born because of brilliance or born because of effective planning. It was born very simply out of the simplicity of the concept and opportunistically of just looking around and saying, we have such remarkable talent in this country, such a massive collection of people. Why can't we do this for the rest of the world? It was that simple. It wasn't complicated. Harvard Business School has done a case study on us. They were trying to get me to you know, make a big deal out of it, put strategy around it, et cetera. And I said, with the best will in the world, I cannot tell you that this was such brilliant thinking, et cetera. It was opportunistic. And I stumbled upon the idea one day. I was walking around a parking lot in Chennai looking for my car. I still remember that time. And sometimes there is a moment in time which you remember because I suddenly said, aha, why shouldn't we do that? There was a little bit of a problem. And that's why it's a story of foolishness. We had no telecom lines. We had no infrastructure. We had very few roads. I didn't have an office. I didn't, couldn't find people who we could train. I didn't know how to go out and get people who would understand the variety of industries that we thought we should work for. So within that, I started asking people, do you think this might work? Now, the problem was, one, convincing people in the US that this is an idea. By the way, today we take it for granted. In those days, nobody traveled to India. Our airports didn't work very well, et cetera. This is not that long ago. This is 15, 20 years ago. In those days, it was hard to travel to India. It was hard to actually uh, get visas. You were worried about what the environment was like, et cetera, et cetera. Today, we take this all for granted, but these were real issues. And yet, what was our proposition? That we would go bring jobs from there and bring them to India. Think of what that says. 
what if I came to you and say, can I take a million jobs out of India and take them perhaps to Vietnam? What do you think would be the reaction of the world to that? But in the US, God bless them, they have many, many, many faults. But in business, they are the best. In the US, they grabbed the idea. I went to them with that idea, and they grabbed it and said, yes, we're willing to try it. Show me how. And then, on the phone line, I was trying to convince people to give us money and give us funding. This was all part of GE. I went to the telecom department in India, and I said, can you give me uptime on phone lines? At 99%, they said, you'll be lucky to get uptime <laughs> at all, of any kind. I went to the transportation department. I said, can you help me? And I went to the taxi guys, et cetera, and said, can, I, can you help me get one or 2,000 people every day back and forth into Gurgaon and out? And they said, well, we have eight cabs, and you know, we'll see what we can do about the rest. We needed technology, we needed dialers, we needed modems, we needed all of those things, none of which was available in India. So I did something else. I went and asked 10 people I respected, do you think this idea of bringing work to India over phone lines and getting it done here and sent back will work? All 10 said, absolutely not. No chance. At that point, I knew I have to do this. Because it is conventional wisdom that defeats most innovation and most ideas. And it is conventional wisdom that doesn't allow you to take the risks that all of you must take in your lives to drive change. So my biggest motto is this. I don't know if you can read it, but I'm just going to read it out. And it says very simply, according to recognized aerotechnical tests, the bumblebee cannot fly because of the shape and weight of its body in relation to its total wing area. The bumblebee doesn't know this, so it goes ahead and flies anyway. That, I think, should be the story of India. No matter what we think is impossible or what is not doable, is something we must grab and do, because that, there is only one life to lead. So we went for it. We went for it and started the first process. By the way, the first processes that we started were in a room about this size. Couldn't have been more than 20 feet by 14 feet. We asked people to bring curtains and saris from home because we didn't have equipment. We didn't have furniture. We asked people to collect it together, and we started testing. We would test for one thing, we would test for connectivity, we would test for speed, we would test for literacy, we would test for training. We would test every day was, I must tell you, a new disaster. One day, the office wouldn't work. The next day, we were in Gurgaon. There was no office there. Today, it was a village. It was a true gown. There was only one building. We were in it. We had to find more buildings. There weren't any buildings. And so we were running around trying to solve for everything. We were trying to solve for infrastructure, for human resources, for resources to serve our employees, for transportation, most of all for learning. But we had hope. We had energy. We had drive. We were willing to try. I met Jack Welch in those days. He had sent me to India. And I met him, and I said, Jack, this is what I'm trying to do. We ran a very informal company, and I would, bless, I would tell all of you, be as informal as you can in your life, because informality drives communication and ability to talk to each other very, very openly and easily. And he, looked, he said, what are you doing? I said, Jack, this is what I'm trying. And he looked at me and says, Pramod, you're committing suicide. I was a very senior person. I was running GE Capital in Asia. And he said, you're committing suicide. It'll never work, and you'll do something bad. Because guess what we were doing? We were closing the books of accounts for GE Capital companies and subsidiaries all over the world from India. Now, if that phone line went down or our people weren't able to close, it would have massive ramifications across the company. I looked at him. I said, I know I'm committing suicide, Jack. I have one life to lead. I'm going to go for it. If it blows up, so be it. There was no option, right? You can't not go for it. You can't look at that compelling an opportunity and not do something for it. We have the next slide. So one, if I may just go back, there's one thing I've learned. And I've learned this from the Americans. 
which is no fear of failure. There is nothing any of you have to fear. If you don't, you will always have another job. You will always have another opportunity. If you try something, lesson number one, grab an opportunity when you see it, don't let it go. Half the time we see opportunities, never recognize who, what they are. Grab it. Two, don't fear failure because we're already privileged and we already have everything at our beck and command. We don't need to worry about fear of failure. We don't need to worry about failing, even though in our society, I will tell you in India, one of the things I hope we change is, you know, my mother and father always used to ask me when I started down this path of running GenPAC, I was running G Capital Asia, Nam Tha, title, everything is there. And I told my, my mother, I said, I'm going to go off and do this other thing. <laughs> and so she didn't tell me, but she called my sister up and said, Iska dimag pagal ho gaya. <laughs> you know, he has lost it. <laughs> and then later on, she called me up and said, you have a name, you have stature. Why are you taking this risk? And it was impossible for me to explain to a mother that this was the best chance I had to do something new and different. So Gurgaon erupted. Thousands of people used to come through our doors asking us, what are we doing and what were we doing? We were doing very simple processing. We were doing some calls. We were doing IT help desks. We were doing analytics, supply chains, all sorts of things using the talent that we have in India. We had to train people because we didn't know how to train anyone and nobody was coming with the experience base that we needed, right? So in healthcare today, you may not know this, but if a CT machine breaks down in the US, they actually call our offices here. And in those offices, when they call them, there's someone there who understands how a CT machine works. But we knew a couple of things. One, that culture eats strategy for breakfast. What do I mean by that? Culture binds companies, binds communities. Having seen what was happening in India, the head of China called me up and said, you know, in Dalia, northeastern China, we have a whole community of Chinese people who speak Japanese. So do you think we could serve Japan from Manchuria in China, a place called Dalian? Now, Dalian is now very famous as the Bangalore of China. In those days, they had never seen an Indian in their life, I don't think, as we walked into that place. And winter, it's minus 20 in Dalian. It's a seaport. It has aircraft carriers, all of those lined up in its battles against Japan. And off I sent a bunch of people from India who went off to, uh, to Dalian to say, let me show you what I can do. And we had Indians teaching Chinese who spoke Japanese how to do business in Japan. And that was true globalization at its best. And now we're in Brazil and we're in 26 countries across the board. I don't work with them anymore. Let's go. With them anymore. But this is my motto. It was luck. I was in the right place at the right time. You have to grab it. Timing because the telecom revolution was upon us, and before that, we couldn't possibly have done this. At that point in time, getting a telecom license was, was hard. Skills because we understood processes. GE was a master at processes, so we understood processes. But most of all, I will tell you, I had a team around me that had guts. I used to send them off. We were trying to get business from the US, and I told them all, I said, I'll give you a one-way ticket to the US. I will send you the return ticket once you've got some orders, OK? And in the meantime, figure it out for yourself. And all these people would get onto planes and go off to the US, and they'd be running around trying to get orders and trying to convince people to do the impossible, which is send us their mission-critical work to a country they'd never heard of, to people they'd never met before, to a, a completely new concept. And these people had guts, and they took off, and they and we believed in each other. We were the founders. We had to be innovative about everything. We had to be innovative about work. We had to be innovative about licenses. We were running night shifts. We had to be innovative about training. We had to hire people. But we used to have a sign up which used to say, uh, trespassers will be recruited because we were hiring at such pace at that point in time. We had signs up which basically told everybody that, look, Watch out, otherwise we'll put you into English language training before you know it. Before you can blink, everybody would be put there. Or Six Sigma and Lean. We built our business 
based on that. And we were really the core of this entire ecosystem around the business process management industry. So the contribution of this industry, as you know, is unparalleled. I don't want to talk about numbers, but the contribution that is actually more severe in terms of what it's done to the social dynamics. We had masses of young men and women working together in Gurgaon, living in cities, living, and they're all living. It empowered women like it's never before. These were young women we were recruiting from across India who were able to earn money, send money home. Many of, their, many of these women, their own families could never afford this. I hope more than 50% of you become entrepreneurs, run small businesses, come up with new ideas, try something. How will it affect you? It won't. And when your parents say, no, beta, don't go there, it's too much risk, say, I have one life to lead. If I don't take this risk, what will I do? It's skilling at scale. I've now started a skills academy business which skills in the villages and small towns of India and the small villages and tribal areas. Skilling at scale, vocational skills that give us real experience, real, real practical knowledge, which allow us to get employable immediately. So my message, very simple. One life to lead, take a risk, drive change. We need more change in our country than anywhere else in the world. I travel all over the world. This place needs to change the most. You're going to do it, not aged people like me, not guys with gray hair wandering around. You're the ones who are going to do it. But you're going to do it only because you have to have a saying I always use, never lose your sense of impatience. Patience is not a virtue. Never lose your sense of impatience. Wake up in the morning and say, what do you want to do? How do I drive for change? How do I take more action? How can I improve my life? No fear of failure, make some bets, take some risk. What do you have to lose anyway? And at the end, never give up. This entire BPM journey happened because I was convinced it was a great compelling proposition. I am no genius, I'm no great IQ guy, but I thought this seemed like a good idea. I wasn't gonna give up. I hope all of you will find that one or two great ideas that you just won't give up on. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you.